My name is Lucas, and tonight I will be reading from Philippians 2:12 through 18. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you living, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining lo- like bright lights in a world of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life, then on the day of Christ's returns, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God. Just like your faithful service is an offering to God, and I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I share your joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lucas. Give it up for him. It's awesome. Give it up for God's word as well. Man, we we are Bible people around here. If you're new with us, my name is Pastor Adam. I'm the youth pastor. Glad to have you with us at Trademark tonight. Uh, We're all about the Word of God. We're all about the Bible. We've been going through a particular part of the Bible called the book of Philippians. This is a letter that Paul wrote to a church in the Greek, ancient kind of, was it Greek? Uh, I think it was Greek. Ancient Greek city of Philippi. Uh, encouraging them to grow in their faith, encouraging them to to grow in unity with one another. We've been taking down this this book just kind of section by section, verse by verse, looking through it, uh, getting the big picture theme of what does it look like to be a mature Christian. And what we've argued is that every week we've gotten a different attitude that helps contribute to our maturity as followers of Jesus. We need to not just stay stagnant. We shouldn't just, you know, raise your hand and pray the prayer and give your life over to Jesus at the altar at camp. And then that's good, but you should continue to grow. You should continue to grow in your faith. You should continue to be a fully grown Christian. We got far too many baby Christians walking around in the world, and we need to be fully grown followers of Jesus. So the book of Philippians teaches us how we're going to do that. I need some less talking over there in the corner. Thank you. Um, So the title of tonight's message is Sacrificial Obedience. This is the attitude that we're looking at, sacrificial obedience. We're, we're going to look at what this is and why it's important. But I want to remind you of what we've been talking about. We're told we need to follow the example of Jesus. That's what Paul said last week. We looked at this massive poem, this hymn, this really important passage that's at the center of the entire letter where Paul tells the story of Jesus' life and then says, hey, this is your example to follow. Jesus surrendered his life. He sacrificed himself. He laid himself down for other people, and we need to imitate that example. We need to sacrifice ourselves in how we live in the world, in how we treat one another, in how we follow God. We need to lay our lives down as a Christian Your life does not belong to you. As a follower of Jesus, my life is not my own. It belongs to God. And so life is no longer about what I want to do or who I want to become. Life is about becoming the man that God wants me to be. Or for our ladies in the room, life is uh, is about becoming the woman that God wants you to be. He has a design and a plan on your life. And we need to lay our plans, our designs, our desires down and walk in the plan that God has for us. And the way that God forms us into the person he means for us to be, God forms us through obedience. You can write this down. Obedience matters. Obedience matters. Look with me at verse 12 and 13. Very important section here in this letter. Dear friends, you've always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Look, work hard to show the results of your salvation. 
Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Work hard to show your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Obedience matters. Paul says you need to work what? Work how? Work hard. Put some effort in. This isn't something we want to hear. This isn't something I want to hear or emphasize or focus on. I want to focus on what God has done on, on the gospel, on that your deadly doings down cease, your doing all was done. I want to focus on what Jesus did. But tonight, Paul wants us to focus on what we must do. See, we live in a time and a place when we are a little bit allergic to hard work. Our world is allergic to hard work. Innovation makes everything faster and easier. We're the age of the microwave where you just throw your dinner in the oven and, and hit it on and, and it starts cooking and, and you're done in two minutes. We, we live in the age of fast food where you just go through the drive through or, or you order on your phone now and it's there freaky fast and it's ready. Put the lazy man in charge. Use your calculator. Research with Google and not a library. I'm, I'm not just trying to be an old person here, uh, but I'm genuinely concerned for our generation because we've lost the art of working hard in many ways. I'm not just trying to grumble about our culture. This means something for us spiritually. Uh, because we've forgotten how to work hard, we often will settle for sin in our lives where it should not be. Because we resist the need of hard work. We exist. We, we, we resist the importance of Getting in there and going to work, putting sin to death. We often settle for sin because it's hard to get up and read your Bible in the morning. It's difficult. And so because we're allergic to hard work, we just say, well, I'm not going to do it. It is hard to control my tongue. The words I use just slip right on out. It is hard to keep my cell phone in the living room and not take it to the bathroom with me. Because I know that's a wise habit that'll help prevent things that I shouldn't be looking at, things I shouldn't be watching, but that's too hard, and so I keep my cell phone on me at all times. It's hard to be respectful to other people even when I'm being disrespected. It's hard to honor my parents even when I feel dishonored. It is hard to do those things. And because we live in a culture that's allergic to hard work, we will have a tendency to say, ah, it's too hard this is good enough. And what I want to stir in your soul tonight is a holy discontentment. I, I want to stir up within you a, 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 a sense of there's something not right. I'm not satisfied with the way that my life is. Yes, it is hard to obey. It is grueling and it is difficult, but it is worth it. We need to live for the finish line. We said this a few weeks ago, we need to stop living for temporary comforts and pleasures and we need to live with an eternal perspective. We need to live for the glory of God and not our temporary experience. We need to work hard, Paul says. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obedience shows the results of your salvation. This is why obedience matters. Let's put verse 12 back up on the screen, please. I'm sorry, 13, verse 13. Oh, no, it is 12. I'm sorry. Verse 12, work hard to show the results of your salvation. This is the product of obedience. When we obey God with deep reverence and fear, we show that we are truly saved. We are truly Christians. It's the proof that God is working in our life. What does this word salvation mean? Yes, it means your sins are forgiven. Yes, it means you've been brought from death to life. Yes, it means his mercy is more. Though your sins are many, God's mercy is greater than your sin. But, write this down, salvation is transformation. Salvation is transformation. Salvation is not just forgiveness. It's not just God sweeping your sin under the rug and saying, it's okay, I've taken care of it. Salvation is God transforming your life, making you into a new sort of creation, making you into a different person, restoring who he always meant for you to be. This is salvation. And your obedience is the proof that this transformation is happening. When you obey God, you prove to yourself and to the world that yes, God is really working in my life. I really am a Christian. I really am saved. Do you desire to obey God? I'm not asking if you're perfect. I'm not, no one's perfect. I'm not asking if you never stumble or never fall. 
I'm not even asking if you're on an upward trajectory, but I'm asking, do you have a desire to obey God? Is there, looking at verse 12, is there deep reverence and fear in the way that you conduct your life? Do you look at God as a cosmic genie or a sugar daddy who will forgive all your sins and give you all you want? Or do you look at God as the holy, awesome God of the universe? We have a small view of sin because we have a small view of God. We don't understand how big God is, how holy God is, how pure and perfect God is. And so we don't recognize how stanky and awful and wicked our sin truly is. Do you have reverence and fear when you think about God? Is there some trembling? Is there something within you that says, hey, I need to please God with my life? There ought to be. We ought to have an element within ourselves that I need to please God. I need God to be pleased with my actions. I need to live for God's pleasure and no one else's because that is the drive of Christianity. And that is what Jesus produces in your life when you become a Christian. If you have no desire for obedience, you probably aren't a Christian. I'm just going to say that you probably still need to give your life over to Jesus. If there's nothing in you that says, I'm not right and I need someone to help me, if there's nothing within you that says, I need to please God with my actions, God's grace probably hasn't worked on your life. If there's no fruit in your life, if you're not growing, if, there's not, if God isn't producing something inside of your life, if there's not some transformation going on, you're probably not a Christian. If there's no sense of urgency when you hear my voice right now, if there is no prompting of the Holy Spirit saying, I need to get my life right, if there's no conviction of sin, if there's no awareness of your need to please God, then you have no hope in this life. And your only hope is to cast yourself onto the feet of Jesus. Because salvation is transformation. And if there's not a work of transformation happening in your life, then you are not a Christian. If there's not an awareness of your need for God, of your sinfulness and your need for the mercy of God, the grace of God to help you, if there's not an awareness of the fact that I need to live for Jesus, then God likely has not worked on you yet. It's not too late. There is still hope for you, but not as you are. Your only hope is to cast your life on the feet of Jesus. Your only hope is to come to God and say, just as we sang the words of those songs, God, my God, I need you. I need you now. My sin is great, but your mercy is greater. I confess, just as we together prayed during our, our time of worship, we confessed our sin to God. We received his forgiveness. That is the only hope for a sinful human. That is the only hope we have. We need to come to Jesus. But once we come to Jesus, we need to begin to walk out the call that he's given us. We need to begin to walk in obedience. But look at verse 13. Because I've laid a heavy weight. I've, I've laid some, some pressure on you. Hopefully you sense a little bit of a gap between where you are now and where God wants you to be. But look at the grace of God in this verse right here. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Obedience is necessary. Obedience matters. You need to obey God with deep reverence and fear. The KJV says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But... God is working in you. You got to do some work, but God is working in you. Obedience does not save you. God's grace is what saves you. We're going to look at this more in a couple weeks. This is where Paul's going to go in chapter 3, and he's going to tell us more about the grace of God that transforms us and saves us. But we cannot rely on our own efforts and obedience to please God. As important as obedience is, as much as we should have a desire to please God, we need to recognize that desire, that power, it comes from God. Obedience does not save you. God's grace saves you. But catch this, the grace which saves you 
also makes you obedient. Let's look at verse 13 again. The grace that saves you also makes you obedient. God is working in you. He's doing something in your life. Salvation is transformation. God has given you his grace. He has saved you. He's brought you from death to life. He's brought you into his kingdom. And now this is what he's doing in your life. He is giving you the A, the desire, and B, the power. A, the desire. The desire to obey God is not something you need to work up in yourself. You don't need to beat yourself into some fervor or get yourself into some frenzy and get frothed at the mouth and cry in alligator tears. God works this desire inside of you. God convicts you of sin. He gives you his Holy Spirit. Upon the moment that you come to receive Jesus, he places his Holy Spirit within your life, seals you for salvation, and his Holy Spirit is constantly prompting you and reminding you, hey, this isn't how you ought to act. Hey, this isn't wise. Hey, this isn't good. And if you hear that voice, then take heart because God is working in your life. If you hear his voice, take heart because he is giving you the desire to please him. Conviction of sin is a gift. So often we treat the Holy Spirit's voice as something that we hate to hear. We think of it as this nag and we say, would you just shut up and leave me alone? But he won't because he loves you too much to leave you in your sin. He loves you too much to let you run away from him. He loves you too much to let you disobey so, so greatly that you would offend permanently the grace of God. His Holy Spirit seals you and keeps you and holds you and reminds you, no, don't go there. No, don't say that. No, don't wash that. No, don't do this. No, that's not wise. No, Look at Jesus. This is the example. This is God's gift to us. He gives you this holy discontentment. He gives you this awareness. I'm not satisfied. Listen, if you hear my voice and you say, oh, I'm a mess. I'm in trouble. That's good news. Rejoice because that's God's Holy Spirit speaking to you. If you hear my voice and think, oh, no, I might not be a Christian. That is the best news in the world because it's the guarantee that you are a Christian you hear my voice and you don't care what I'm saying, you can't wait for me to shut up so you can get on to the next thing tonight, I'd be so concerned for your soul. I am so concerned for your soul. God is giving us the desire to obey him, but he's also giving us the power, and this is such good news, because not only do I desire righteousness, but God is going to let me do it. He's going to give me the strength. I can't obey on my own. You can't be good enough on your own. But with Jesus Christ working within you, you can please God. You can work out your own salvation. You can live an acceptable life because God is working in you, giving you A, the desire, but B, he's giving you the power to do what pleases him, the strength to do what is right, the strength to say no to temptation and yes to righteousness. The strength to ignore the voice of the enemy knocking on your heart and, crawl, and, and, and pulling you and calling out to you and to say, no, I'm not going to live for that. I have something better to live for. This is the grace of God at work in your life, giving you power. You won't be perfect, but you should strive for perfection because God is giving you the power. You will not be perfect, but you will be victorious. Man, you should write that down. You will not be perfect, but you will be victorious. You will win the fight against sin. It's going to take longer than you like. This is a long process. I, I hope I've gotten you hyped up a little bit for the grace of God, but I don't want to oversell you. I don't want you to think that tomorrow morning, because I'm a Christian, all my problems are going to go away, and I'm never going to struggle with sin again. Rather... God is over years, over decades, most likely, going to work on your heart slowly, gradually transforming you into the image of his son. This is the process of salvation. This is the process of transformation. Salvation happens in an instant when you confess your sin. You are fully forgiven, fully, freely, forever, past, present, future, and then for the rest of your life, God is working on you, turning you into his masterpiece working in your life, chipping away at old habits and bad patterns and making you like Jesus, what you will see, you'll look back at your life and you'll see a story of transformation. You'll see the story of salvation. You may not see it now because you're 15, because you're 12, because it's only been a few years that you're walking with Jesus. And so don't get discouraged right now. Keep walking, keep following, keep obeying. And in 10 years, you will have such a story. In 20 years, 
Oh, the goodness of God on your life that you'll be able to see. In 40 or 50 years, man, if you haven't sat down with a senior saint and asked them to tell you about how God's been working in their life over the years, you gotta do that. You gotta do that. I'm so grateful for men and women in our church who have lived long, faithful lives who I can sit down with, have breakfast with them, and just say, tell me how God's worked in your life over the years. And I can hear stories. And they can tell me the story of their life, the story of God's grace as God has empowered their obedience. Here's, here's how empowered obedience works. As you work, God is working. As you work, God is working. So you start walking in obedience and you trust that he's the one who's gonna give you the strength to keep going. You simply begin and when you fail, you begin again. The life of a Christian is the life of a thousand beginnings but with each beginning, you make further progress. So begin again. You may have messed up last night. Begin again today. You may have thrown it all away two hours ago. Begin again. You may have walked in this room feeling a failure and recognizing I'm a wretch, but it's time to begin again. God is not done with your life. God has more for you. The grace that got you this far will get you through to the end. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to please him. So don't rely on your own doing because it's God's doing. So this is our obedience. It's so important for us. It's so important for, for our salvation. It's important for us in honor of Jesus. But, but I want to touch on one more thing because this text doesn't stop here. Obedience is also something for other people. So I want to I briefly talk about why we should obey for the sake of others. So look at verse 14 and 15. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. You can write this down. Obedience is a witness to non-believers. Obedience is a witness to non-believers. We've talked about this before. You are an example to the world around you. If, if, Je if, the, if Jesus is in your life, if the process of salvation is Jesus transforming you into a reflection of his own self, if the process of salvation is God transforming you to reflect Jesus, then you need to reflect Jesus into the life of other people. How are other people going to see Jesus? Is Jesus walking around in flesh right now? Of course not. But of course he is because his body is walking around with flesh. There's a reason the Bible, you ever thought about that? The Bible talks about the church as the body of Christ. Maybe you've heard that before. This is because as God transforms us, as God works in our life, we reflect Jesus and we become the body of Christ. We become the physical representation of Jesus to the world as we live a life of humility and love and kindness. As we live a life rejecting sin and choosing righteousness, we become an image of God to the world. Your obedience is a witness to non-believers. And so work hard to make that reflection shine brightly. If other people followed your example right now, the way you're living, in your speech, in your attitude, in your actions, would they be closer to Jesus or further from him? just an honest question, and it's good to ask yourself that every once in a while, fairly often. In fact, I challenge you, ask yourself that question every morning. If people follow my example today, will they be closer to Jesus or further from him? And then try to live your life every day in a way that you give this good example, this good reflection to others. Obedience is a witness to non-believers. When you reflect Jesus in everything you say and do, you prove that the gospel is true. You prove that there is hope for people to change. You prove that there is a better life to live than what the world offers. So, live well, witness well. But here's the other thing. Obedience isn't just a witness to non-believers. Obedience is an encouragement to other Christians. Verse 16. Hold firmly to the word of life, then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. Paul says, obey for the sake of others, but also hold firmly to the word of life so that I 
will be proud. This is Paul speaking to his church. I, your pastor, your apostle, the person who planted you, the person who's encouraging you, I will be proud by your obedience. Your obedience is an encouragement to other Christians. When we obey, we remind each other that we aren't alone in the world. It's hard to be a Christian in 2022. It's hard to be a Christian attending high school in Moreno Valley or Paris. It's hard to be a Christian, gosh, it's hard to be a Christian attending middle school in Moreno Valley. It's so difficult. But when you live as a Christian, you encourage everyone else around you, hey, this is something you can do. And when we all live as followers of Jesus, we encourage one another. We show each other, hey, this is possible. This is something, and I get encouraged by your obedience, and you get encouraged by your friend's obedience. And when we all live for Jesus, we get this to be cheesy, not just a peer pressure. We get a pure pressure. Yeah, not just peer pressure. Pure pressure, P-U-R-E. Your obedience, your passion, your participation, it helps others be more passionate. Even on a Wednesday night, when you show up in the room, gosh, when when one or two of you are lifting your hands in worship and and entering in and participating, it's an encouragement to the rest of us to, hey, let's enter into worship. When when, when one or two of you start singing loudly and and participating, it's an encouragement. The others, they hear your voice. They say, I'm going to sing too. Sing. I was talking to Pastor Gabe on Sunday. He said, hey, we need to sing to one another when we come together in church. I'd never thought of that before. It's kind of wild, but it's true. We, We sing so that you can hear me and so that you can hear me and so that you can hear her and she can hear you and you can hear him we sing for each other encouraging one another it's an encouragement when we gather together when you participate in the sermon when you shout out amens and that's good it's an encouragement to your fellow listeners say oh i should pay attention right now when i'm struggling to obey your obedience spurs me on this is the one time the bible tells you to be competitive to compete with one another, outdo one another in showing honor, compete to be the best obeying Christian, not so that you can lord it over everyone else, but so you can set a good example for others to follow. And when you begin to obey and tell your friends about the way you're obeying, not to brag or to make them feel bad, but to encourage them, hey, it, it's possible. You actually don't have to use the F word in every sentence. You really can do it. You really don't have to listen to songs with explicit words in them or songs that glorify sex and violence and drugs. It's really possible. That, that, that's really going to be okay. You really don't have to watch pornography. That's really possible. We live in a world that wants to normalize that and shove it down your throat no, and say that, that that's what everyone's doing, but you don't have to. You, we can live this counterexample, this countercultural life. So obey to encourage one another. And then finally, uh, this is uncomfortable for me to preach, but it's in the Bible, and so I'm going to preach it. Your obedience encourages your pastor. Your obedience encourages your pastor. This, This is what Paul says. He says, do it for Jesus, do it for yourself, do it for others, and, verse 16, I will be encouraged. Do it, do it for me. And so I'm going to follow the pattern of scripture, and I'm going to preach this for about two minutes before we finish He says in verse 16, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. Paul tells this church, hey, obey so that you can encourage me. And I want to ask you as your pastor, obey because it encourages me when I see you obey. And it reminds me that my work isn't useless. It reminds me that all the time I spend agonizing over texts and praying for you and and working hard throughout the week to put on a good service, it reminds me that it's worth it. Obey for, for myself. Obey for your youth leaders who, who give their time, who give their, for free. They, they volunteer to be here and show up to support you guys. Obey and let them know that this is worth it. It is hard to do ministry, but I can say for myself that when I see you living for Jesus, it encourages me. When you're hungry for God's presence, it encourages me. When you devour God's word, it strengthens me. When you seek God in prayer, it fills me with joy. When you love one another, it gives me hope. When you obey God's word, it reminds me that it's okay. I can keep going and I can keep pressing through. There are hard days for me in ministry, and you guys are the reason that I keep going because I wanna see you succeed. I wanna see you live this out. I wanna see you falling in love with Jesus. I wanna see the Lord transforming your life and so obey because it encourages me. It encourages my heart when you live for Jesus. It gives me strength to keep going. 
And even when my life is poured out like a drink offering, when I come home at the end of the day empty and drained, when I feel like, oh, I just need to quit tomorrow morning because there's nothing left, your obedience encourages me and keeps me going. So keep obeying. Keep living for Jesus because it's an encouragement to other Christians. Obey. It matters. It's worth it. So do it. Do it for Jesus. Do it for your own salvation. Do it for others. Do it for non-believers. Do it for your pastor. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that it would lay heavy on our hearts tonight. Would we feel the weight of what you've spoken? We've heard your voice speak through your word, and you have called us into following you, into obedience to your word, into submission to your will. Would we feel that weight, and would it push us to work hard to be the men and women that you've called us to be? And Lord, would you fill us with your strength and your power to live as you've called us to live? Through your beautiful name I pray, amen. Amen. Jesus, Jesus. you are are better better than than anything in this world. Love you guys. Have a great night. We're going to break into groups right now.